I was very excited when John came to us and said that he would like to have an animal ex science activity for the um, teachers. And Dr. Michael and I spent some time trying to figure out what would be good. And I understand a lot of you will have Dr. Michael and Capri a little bit later. And we went back and forth on a few labs and, and we have some that are really hands-on and that sort of thing. But the more I thought about it, I was like, let's try to find something that can hit the broadest base that would also be the most adaptable lab. And so this is the one we came up with. And this one actually was developed a few years ago. Um, some of you I know have had it. We've updated it several times throughout. And it's gone over well in our class because we have more and more of our students, of course, that want to be vets and come from a small animal background. But the lessons in here apply to all animals. It can be large animal feed for cows or horses. It can be feeds for guinea pigs or whatever. And you can really adapt it to what you want. So I'm gonna start out with two questions for you and I just want you to unmute yourselves and kind of give us some ideas. I know that we can do it through chat, but sometimes it's easier just to hear each other. So um, let's get the answer to question one. What percent of the US households own a pet right now? Anybody know? 82%. Okay, that's not too far off. Anybody else? 84%. Okay, yep, we're a little bit high. Um, you'll, I'll show you the answer in just a second. Um, but I think all of you would agree the majority of people have a pet, I think, and that's a big thing. And then number two is kind of an interesting one. And if you happen to remember it from my class, don't necessarily spoil the answer. But by total numbers, what's the most popular pet in the US? Cat. Okay, cat, okay. Anybody else? Fish? Yep. Now I'm gonna show you the numbers here. Okay, this is from 2018. To update it to 2019 would have cost me about $100. And I figured these numbers are good enough for $100 today. But in 2018, there were 94 million cats and about 90 million dogs. So they're two of the most popular pets by far. And another area that is pretty significant is birds. Um, I have a fraternity brother that graduated with you know, a couple of years after me that is the leading bird doctor in New Jersey and they do really, really well. Then reptiles, you know, snakes, salamanders, lizards, about 9 million. Small animals, um, and these would be things like your gerbils, hamsters, rats, mice, um, about 14. Saltwater fish, about 18 which doesn't seem like much, but then when you do freshwater fish, about 139 million, okay? So purely by numbers, if you mean number of pets, fish are the leaders, but you can look at numbers a different way. And this is the way I prefer to look at them. First of all, it was 67% in 2020 that owned a pet. Okay, so, 63 million people had a, at least one dog in their house. 42 million had at least one cat. And then only 12 million had fish. So think about all the people you know, or maybe some of you, I already saw some animals running around here today. Um, how many fish can you get in one aquarium? Generally aren't gonna be one or two, they're gonna be several. And a lot of people I know have one dog and two cats. And so I think that explains a little bit why the cat number tends to run a little bit higher. But the other key thing that I think is really interesting about this is people spend tons of money on their pets. Okay, and before I get to this next slide, I'd like to ask another question and a couple of you can chime in. What do you think the average dog costs the average household each year? A thousand dollars? Is that vet vet bills and food? Yes. Oh, I would probably all dog expenses for a typical dog in a typical year. Uh okay. I guess I'll say a couple thousand then. Okay, you were a little bit closer with your first guess. Okay. Um, 
People spend money on pets just like they do pe members of their own family. That has really changed over the years. In 2021, I really believe the total expenses for pets in the United States are going to go over 100 billion, which when you start thinking about it, that is monstrous because I grew up in the days when you went to your local Agway store and had about three kinds of dog foods and three kinds of cat foods and you picked one. Now, I should have invested in Pet Smart and all of these other things and really done well, but I didn't. But 38 billion on food, which is the leading one, which is no big surprise because no matter what your animal enterprise is, feed is usually the biggest one. Vets are about 30 billion. Your dog average expense about 1380. So that is mainly food, vet care, supplies. Believe it or not, one thing that people are doing way more is dressing their dogs up in clothes. So that's included in there as well. Cats run about 900 a year. And um, depending on the age of the cat, it's no different than age of humans. As they get older, the vet bills tend to go up and some things along those lines. Now, this is totally unrelated to my talk today, but there are a couple things I just want to mention to you. What effect do you think the pandemic has had on pet ownership? Um, I think it's been a good thing. I think um, there's been a lot more people adapting, especially last year during quarantine because they're lonely and they need a friend. You are so exactly right. There are a lot of animal shelters that basically do not have very many animals to adopt right now because so many of them got adopted during the pandemic. People were looking for some companionship and a little bit more responsibility being stuck at home. And that's that. And then I think one of the most interesting statistics I've seen on pets over the last year or so is the millennial generation. And I don't know exactly how that is defined, but we've all heard the term millennials. A third of them, their decision to move from an apartment to a house is based on owning a dog. The number one driver of all factors for millennials buying a house is whether or not they have a dog. It ranked first in the survey. So kind of amazing when you think about it. So anyway, why did I pick this particular exercise? I think I um, alluded to it. Most animals have a dog or, or most students have a dog or cat at home. I love this one because it can demonstrate some good nutritional principles in a very applied way. And you can make it adaptable to any animal. It's not very difficult to do. So just a couple background things. Um, I think before students do this, they should know the six main nutrient groups like carbohydrates, proteins, things like that, and some of the common vitamins and minerals. So I'm not going to get into a detailed lesson, but you can kind of pick and choose on some of these um, next couple things, what you would pick to discuss if they haven't had the background in your class already. The six nutrient groups, water, protein, carbs, fats, vitamins, all of those, and what their functions are. And then a couple key things that the students do need to understand before they start this um, is that fats do contain more energy than the other nutrient groups. And also fiber in a cat and a dog is not very digestible. Okay, now if it were a cow or a horse or something, that would be whatever. And then the next couple slides, and you would probably simplify, definitely simplify these down to what you actually wanted to discuss, are the different vitamins and their functions. Yeah, just a couple key ones. I always think of vitamin A as the vision vitamin, and vitamin E is helps with immunity and red blood cells, and different ones have different functions, and kind of the same thing with minerals and what their major roles are. For example, the top couple here, calcium and phosphorus, both build bones and teeth and they have some other functions. And you could decide how detailed you wanted to be with this as you go. So do you all have nutrients and nutrition in your animal science lessons or um, how detailed is it? Like how much detail do you guys go in? So I can say for my animal science classes, we cover like the six major nutrients and they need to be like, be able to identify different examples 
of feed, like where those animals can get it. And we go in a little bit more detail in vet science, but it's pretty general, at least for my animal science. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I, I cover it every year um, in some form or fashion as it applies to, honestly, I, I kind of tend to tailor it to the type of students that I have as how deep I go into it because some years I have students that have the aptitude for it and some years we can't really even get to ration balancing, you know, like, so it's, it varies, but I always try to hit on the main points like what you're talking about. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I must admit, Jonathan, it's it's a little bit uh, tricky here. I wanted to uh, say, you know, uh, Sarah Beth Red instead of Sarah Beth with her real name or whatever, because the colors are in your Zoom boxes and kind of distracted by that. But bottom line is you can pick and choose what you need to cover, what you don't need to cover, how detailed you want to be or whatever, because you can make this pretty much anything you want. So I do want to spend a little bit of time, and this is where I would go back to the exercise that you got mailed. So why don't we pull that out if you have it in front of you. I do want to talk a little bit about AFCO. Uh, let me see, I'm going to switch over to our exercise, I believe. Oh, here we go. All right, that show you the lab exercise. You seeing that? Yep, good. All right, so just a few general things about it. You could read through the introduction as well as I can about the pet food industry and how it's changed and those kinds of things. Um, I think it's nice to have students know the general statements because these three statements um, show up on feed labels, or particularly for dogs and cats and guinea pigs and things like that. And there are some feeds that carry this second statement, which means they never were tested on a nutrient trial. They were just analyzed in a lab and they may or may not be good. This complete and balanced nutrition is kind of the gold standard because that means it went through a nutrient trial um, for at least 10 weeks in young animals, a little bit less on old animals but they showed that um, it worked. Then some other things on the labels, I'm not gonna read all of this, you can do this as you want, but the percents protein and fat, the percentages of per, or fiber and moisture. Then one thing you'll find, and you'll see this on the labels as well, some feeds list very specific vitamins and minerals, maybe even some amino acids, others don't list them at all. And I would generally say that animal sources for fat and protein tend to be a little more digestible than most plant sources. And um, so that first AFCO statement shows that the feed is digestible and it benefits the animal. So that's why that's an important one. Then I would point out to the kids that each um, label has to list the ingredients and the first ingredient is always the one that's contained in the highest weight of the food. So the example I gave, a chicken could be first in two of them, and one it might make up 35%, the other it might only make up 15%, but if it's still the main first ingredient, it's gonna be listed first. And then feeding statements and all of that. So with that, what I would like to do would be to, let me see if I can do this. Uh, let me see, how many of you are on here? 14. I'm going to create four breakout rooms. And I'm just going to manually assign them. And Jonathan, you can pop, pop back out to the main session. So why don't you work through the lab with your two partners? And I'll give you probably, I don't know, maybe like a half hour. That should be enough. And you can chit chat if you get done a little bit early. And then we'll come back in. I'll give you about 25 minutes. We'll come in about 10 after 10, if that's okay. Okay, does that sound good to everybody? Uh, 
Okay, they should be opening here, so you should be able to join your room. Hey, Jonathan. Looks good. Is that about what you expected? Absolutely. Yep. I can, they're, uh, they're, I, you can just tell they're, they're ready to get into this. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it'll go well. I think it's, it's kind of fun. Absolutely. That, like I said, one thing to, I like is everybody has a pet. Right. And the fact that they get to work together with one another without actually being together is great. Mm hmm. So, well, no, honestly, you might as well pause the recording for until about 10 after um, 10 there. So it's just going to be, a, yeah, we have a few people that aren't quite back yet, but they'll be back soon. So. <laughs> so group how'd you do okay i guess uh, here's the advantage of you all being the teachers i will send an email file to you later with all the answers how's that <laughs> perfect thank you but let, let's kind of go through and um see what you did get and uh, we'll point out a couple of the more major things so let's start with the dog food questions Okay, which one did you pick out to be the puppy chow? Let me just share this so we can go through them here. Uh, let's see here. So which letter did you guys think was the puppy chow? Anybody want to volunteer? Uh, Sarah Beth put it in the chat. We said A. Yeah, you're right. And why was that? Um, we noted how high the protein and fat content was. And that was kind of our dead giveaway is what we went with. Yep. And the other thing that you should have noticed is it was also higher in calcium and phosphorus. Because young dogs have to still keep going in the bone development area. So those are the main things. You hit it right on the head, the fat and protein, because they need energy, and then the higher calcium and phosphorus. Okay, which one do you think had the most energy? I think that would also be A, because of the fat and protein. Which one did you pick out having the least? I think it's going to work better to just unmute and shout your answers out, to be honest with you. I'm not B. Yeah, because that's lower in the fat and protein. Very good. Okay, um, B and C, what did you differentiate on those? Anything? I so our group talked about, sorry, our group talked about how B might be for like an older dog, maybe like a weight management diet versus yep. B might also be for an adult. Yeah, you're exactly right on both cases. Um, B is... It's technically called mature adult dog food. And I'll show you the foods after we're done. And it is lower in fat and protein. And then the other thing is there are two vitamins that are higher in there, um, vitamin E, and then there's something called beta carotene, which actually is a precursor to vitamin A. And that's a very technical question. I know that. And then C is one that you can um, kind of use for any age and be fine. Uh, four kind of covered because they need it for bone growth and kind of same thing with five older dogs need the E for immunity because you all probably have heard of vitamin E and selenium in different ways over the years um, and a lot of feeds will have those and a lot of vets will administer some of those uh, injections it'll be a combination of vitamin E and selenium then vitamin A, beta carotene converts to vitamin A to maintain the vision. 
Okay, I want to kind of see what you mentioned about six. Did any of you come up with an answer with that? How do you think the prevalence of plant sources changes the digestibility and protein quality? You had mentioned early on that protein sources weren't as digestible for dogs, or I'm sorry, that plant sources weren't as digestible for dogs. So that was what we had gone with that it yeah. was just a lower quality feed and it wouldn't have been as digestible. <clears throat> yeah, and then the other big thing, and this is a kind of an important concept you might wanna to relate to the kids, is that animal proteins pretty much have all the amino acids that most animals need, but plant proteins, they might be a decent percentage protein, but they're probably not as well balanced in their, their specific components like the different amino acids. So there is a little bit of difference there. and then. Um, number seven, could you see the difference in the different um, chunks? Why was A smaller? For the size of the dog? Yeah, um, puppies, remember A is the puppy chow, so we don't want to give them really big chunks. They might not be able to eat it as easily and chew it as easily, so that's main reason there. So a couple concepts there, calcium and phosphorus for the younger animals. Younger animals are gonna to tend to be higher in protein and that sort of thing. Uh, let's go down to the cat food here. Okay, which one did you, I know you might not have gotten quite this far, but which one did you guys think could be a kitten chow? Anybody get that far? We said feed F. Okay, let me just check my answers. Yeah, you're right. And again, it's calcium, phosphorus, protein, all of those things, very good. Um, which one is the older one? And I'm actually gonna switch to the answers if that's all right. <laughs> so I think it'll be easier to do. Let me just get on a different one here. Yeah, number two is a difficult question and it's a little bit trickier. The one that's actually for the old cats is D because it has vitamin E. I first thought when I looked at it, it would be E, but it isn't. Um, another big thing, taurine is really important for cats because it's an essential nutrient for cats. Okay, so all of these questions kind of relate back, back to the dog food, and that's why I don't mind putting them up there. But the definite question is taurine is added to cat foods because it's an essential nutrient. Um, let's see here. Did any of you get as far as questions five and six? Doesn't sound like it. So I'll just point out question six is a very interesting question. Okay, there's more calories in feed D than feed E, but yet it's the one recommended for older mature cats. And by the way, older mature cats, the new statistic is I believe about 65% of them are considered obese. <laughs> so it wouldn't really make sense that you would be feeding it a higher energy feed but the other trade-off here is the old cats have a lower feed intake. So the bottom line is that they're not gonna eat as much so it can be a little bit higher energy. So kind of an interesting thing. And then number seven kind of boils down to what we were talking about earlier. Jonathan and I were talking about cats are considered to be carnivores. So you want more animal proteins for them. Um, dogs are considered on the moors, which means they can eat both meat and plants. So they can process the plants a little bit more than cats. So cats are going to be a little bit higher in animal sources. Now, one thing I would just mention, let's say that you want to really treat your cat awesomely. So you just consistently feed it only high quality, almost gourmet cat foods that are meat based. Is that a good idea? What do you guys think? Yeah. 
Wouldn't the cat gain a lot of weight if it was just eating that? That would be one possible outcome. The bigger one is think about this. Proteins, all proteins have a lot of nitrogen in them. And how does, how does nitrogen leave an animal's body and what fluid? You may have heard of this term urea, which is a form of nitrogen. It's going to go out through the urine, and the urine is made by the kidneys. So really high, overly high protein diets tend to enlarge the kidneys of the animals. So that is a problem. And sometimes people don't realize they're treating their cat too well and actually may be causing more harm than good on if they only feed these really high protein diets all from animals, they're gonna have an overload of nitrogen. Then kind of the same things on the different pieces of the dog food and that sort of thing as we go through. So let's go to the last set of questions. I think these are kind of more important here. So I'm not gonna show the answers. I wanna just have you read them and see what discussion points you can come out with that. So should we feed cat food to dog, dogs or vice versa? Particularly, should we feed dog food to cats, I think is a better way to put it. No. Why not? Because cats need more animal protein and the dog food tends to have more plant products in it. Yep. And the other thing is the dog food lacks that taurine. It's not included in dog foods. Or if it is, it would just naturally be occurring, but cats specifically need a source for taurine. And I had a big debate with a student in our class one time because different nutritionists call it an amino acid or an amino acid-like substance, but either way, cats need it. Okay. Um, hey Dale, like what are the symptoms if a cat is lacking in taurine? It affects its metabolism. I'm not 100% sure what everything it does. Okay. But it has an effect on the metabolism and um, how it utilizes nutrients and that sort of thing. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, number two and A and two B, I think you could make your points there about what influences animals and that sort of thing. And then um, B, you can even tie it into a math problem. You know, if it needs one and a half cups a day, Basically, if you're feeding it twice a day, you got to give it three quarters cup. Um, I want to see what you came up with with C. And I know you most likely didn't get a chance to get there, but read that question and tell me what answer you would get there on that. I think you can think about this and come up with the right answers. For me, the <clears throat> simple answer is that a lactating animal is burning a lot of calories. So you need to increase their ration just to meet the caloric intake that they require. Um, and then any nutrients that would be lost in milk production is what I would say. That is exactly right. You know, lactation requires more energy, more protein, more nutrients, or minerals, calcium, especially all of those kinds of things. And then what about the second part of that question? What would be a major influence on how much you should feed that nursing dog? There actually is one factor that is kind of overriding the other ones. Is it the number of offspring? Exactly, the number of, litter, number of animals in the litter. Yeah, for those of you that went to Penn State and were able to do our mouse experiment, you might think about that a long time ago. Yeah, those, we had some mice that had up to 16 or 18 pups and they got skinny really fast and we could hardly keep enough nutrients going into them to maintain their litter. Whereas others may have only had three or five pups and they gained weight like crazy. So, you know, the number of pups does have a big influence on how much you should feed it. So, like I said, I'll get this in a file and get it emailed out to you all. So I think that would be good. But do you see the practicality in this? This is kind of what I was going for. I think that there's ways you can adapt this and make it fun for the students. Let me just show you what foods you are dealing with here. Uh, 
Let's see here. Okay, uh, basically, you're feed A, they're in order of the, the way they went. Feed A was a smart puppy food. B was mature adult, the age seven and older. And C was a regular adult food for um, dogs. And then down here, you can see the different cat foods that we had. The first one was for older cats, then um, healthy adults, and then different brand on the kitten chow. Um, the main reason is the main reason is that when we fed the kitten, or when I went to go buy the feeds, they didn't have kitten chow from IAMS there, so I had to buy Purina. So pretty inexpensive lab. You can just go out, get a few bags of feed, type up a few questions, show them the ingredients, and pick the ingredients you want to show them. So there's a lot of things I like about this lab. So, hey, Dale. Yeah. Is there an extension um, that you could do with this lab to actually like take the foods out of the bags uh, to test things, like a, a little bit more hands-on? Yeah, there probably would be. We don't have time to do it in our class and that's why we don't do it. But um, I think maybe what you could do would be to, um, I'm not exactly sure what you would test. Probably that's the biggest thing. And does anybody have any ideas on what would work there? You guys probably are better idea people than I am on something like that. I feel like I've seen kits that like kind of break down and you can fat, test the fat or the protein maybe. Like um, you have like an additive that you put in a bead and then it breaks it apart and there's a way to test it that way or something. Mm -hmm. And Kelsey, why don't you just chime in with what you put in the um, text box here. Yeah, so um, what I have taught in the past uh, with a vet science class, there is a, um, a certain lab that you do um, comparing those foods, but, uh, whether it be dog or cat food, um, and you can even do uh, wet or dry food. And basically you do, you use different um, like um, inhibitors that show you like if it has this kind of protein, this kind of hard, whatever it is that you're testing for, um, you would do that lab for that. And I believe it's in like the later half of the Cornell vet science curriculum that does that. Um, it's super easy to do as long as you have all the chemicals and things that you need um, for that lab. I think all you need is the, is the, um, the chemicals, a couple of test beakers uh, and a hot plate is really mm -hmm. all, all you need. Mm -hmm. Excellent suggestion, Kelsey. I would also say uh, Jenna and everybody that could be an awesome collaborative um, thing that you work with like the chemistry teacher in your school on of designing that lab process to extract and analyze um, lipids in the feed or carbohydrates or proteins. Um, that's a, an excellent cross disciplinary opportunity. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to determine like fats and proteins and fiber and carbohydrates. I think it's a lot harder to distinguished among the amino acids, specific vitamins, and some of those kinds of things. So, good. All right, well, with that, I'm going to call it a day here. It certainly was really nice to see you guys and um, work with you. So, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you giving up part of your Saturday to go through our lab. So, thank you. <laughs>